All right, welcome back. We are WebD6201 in the winter 2021 semester at Durham, and it's week 11, your week 12, part one of our broadcast. Um, and we're talking about an intro to MongoDB and Mongoose. <clears throat> so where are we uh, this week? We're sitting at right here, week 11. Um, again, stuff that's gonna be due uh, is an in-class exercise. Uh, that we have as well as next week just as a preview uh, we have a test number four which is the last test in our uh, semester I've already released it uh, funny enough so in terms of uh, just stuff that you can do if you really wanted to you can go up online and, and finish off the test it's due next week on Sunday it's not this week but next week I've just released it early in terms of if you want to just go ahead and finish that if you have time if not, I'll give you reminders next week. All right, and then again, Lab 4 is due not next week, but the week after, the last Friday of classes. So last week we talked about Express and the Express Generator, basic routing, and the EJS View Engine. Um, this week what we're talking about is an intro to MongoDB, uh, CRUD operations, which we'll handle mostly tomorrow, um, and an intro to Mongoose, MongoDB Atlas, what is that? Uh, Ice 10, again, due Saturday. Uh, this week is also a, uh, we're observing a holiday on, on Friday, so there's no class on Friday and uh, for anybody. And there's no uh, classes on Sundays, of course, but because this week is also uh, Easter week for those people who are practicing as well as Passover. So those two uh, things are, um, those two things are, those two celebrations are things that people are observing. So in that way, we've moved stuff, stuff away from this week. Uh, into next week. But ICE 10 is due Saturday, so that should be okay for most of you. Um, and again, one thing that I didn't put here is uh, that uh, test four uh, has been released, right, silently, uh, but is due next week. Okay, so that's something that, uh, um, you know, you can do if you have time. All right, so that is uh, what we're doing. Let's talk about uh, Mongo, and uh, in order for us to start, just to just to get going on this, uh, before we get going, um, we have some installations to do today. We have to install MongoDB. We're going to be doing that, um, and a bunch of other stuff. But I'm going to explain what Mongo is at a very high level, and then um, there's 102 slides in this uh, PowerPoint. There's no way I'm going through each one of them in a lot of detail, but they're there for your reference, um, and also some explanations if you need it. So we want to understand really uh, for this one, what is NoSQL um, as an example? What is BSIM? So we have to understand what that is too. Uh, MongoDB collections and documents. How do we query stuff in MongoDB? And how do we work with MongoDB shell as well as other things? So what is NoSQL? So NoSQL, um, you know, for years we've been working with um, structured query language, right? So which is, uh, or you know, basically the way for us to um, communicate with a database, right? So SQL and uh, relational databases for years and years, that has been, I would say, our de facto standard. So a good example of that would be um, Microsoft SQL Server um, and PHP as a combination or uh, Microsoft, sorry, uh, MySQL and PHP, you know? So you have these relational databases also, Postgres, that's another uh, very popular uh, backend server solution or a database, as well as, um, again, PHP or BSP.net uh, or even something else. Okay, so that is kind of a very simple stack. Hello, Calvin. All right, so, um, but, you know, we things have changed, and sometimes we don't just need a large uh, relational database, you know, as an example. Sometimes it's okay to have small um, you know, storage solutions, all right? For example, let's say I just want to store a little, bit of, a little bit of data. I don't need, you know, the structure, the big structure that I'll get with the big, big database, the setup and everything else uh, and all that stuff. So what I'd like to do is think about something like document storage. How can I store simple documents, right, without a lot of overhead, right? Um, so one thing we want to be able to do is this idea of, of having a primary key. And, um, you know, so 
we still want to have some kind of identifier to access our database data, right? Um, but one thing we're moving from is when we talk about NoSQL, so there's no structured query language, we're moving into something called a document-oriented database, document-oriented database, right? And this document-oriented database idea uses some kind of hierarchical document uh, structure. Um, it could use either JSON or XML data, usually as a standard. Um, the one we're going to use, MongoDB, uses something like JSON called BSIM. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and here it talks about um, an example. Um, if you wanted to read through the slides, I'm not going to read this, about, hey, if I want to make some posts, if I had a blog and I have to, some post data, I have a couple of information. I may have a post table and I may have a comments table and I need to link these together. And, you know, it again, lots of overhead for uh, to create this in uh, SQL. But what about, what would this look like in NoSQL database or something like some uh, a document with JSON format? It might look something like this, where we have a title uh, property. You notice that the curly braces denote the document. This, the anything in quotations are properties and values. So key value pairs, right? Again, so a property and a value, a property and a value. So in this case, comments is an array of objects. That's what they are. And the array of objects, each object has, let's say, a title and, um, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, value for the title, maybe even some details for the comment itself, right? So that's something that each of the uh, objects would have inside of this comments array, okay? So, again, documents can be not just, uh, you know, single properties, but also arrays and other things. Um, so, again, um, so and this is an example of how documents or document-oriented databases are very simple to create. As an example, uh, they speak to us. You know, one of the challenges we had when we were talking about uh, mean, the mean stack, Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node, and the whole thing, the whole revolution around JavaScript everywhere is, instead of knowing all these different languages and structures, example, I'd have to know things like um, SQL Server, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, potentially PHP, um, all this other stuff, right? Um, that's a lot of stuff to know just to develop simple pages uh, with front end and back end solution. Whereas with JavaScript everywhere, that kind of that kind of revolution, we still need to know HTML and CSS. Those are the building blocks. We talked about that kind of day one structure, presentation, and then behavior JavaScript, right? So that's from a client side perspective. But then we can use a very JavaScript like structure for the back end. No JS, Express and MongoDB, which is something we're going to be talking about. So that's kind of, you know, instead of, it kind of reduces some of the noise for developers in terms of how we, we create stuff. I'm just going to skip through this. This is just talking about how to establish the blog posts and how to do stuff, uh, stuff like this uh, with uh, a NoSQL database. Okay, so now we're moving into what MongoDB is. So back in 2007, uh, Dwight Merriman and Elliot uh, Horowitz, they formed a company named Tengen. Uh, they created a bunch of different kinds of solutions. One of the things that they uh, came up with uh, was uh, MongoDB, which is an open source uh, uh, project at the time. Um, and MongoDB stands for humongous. They were humongous. Um, and um, it kind of, you know, they kind of used NoSQL data store or a data persistence uh, solution. Right, in order for us to, um, you know, to kind of have access to something that is, uh, you know, document oriented. Again, JavaScript everywhere. Uh, this idea, and it's grown into a project that now has been used by many companies and has uh, uh, hundreds of com contributors. So one of the main goals of MongoDB was to create a new type of database that combined kind of like the stability of, let's say, a relational database, but really fast throughput and low overhead of document-oriented uh, distributed key value data stores that were available to NoSQL databases. That's really, really good. And um, so other, so big companies that use it would be things like, uh, you know, back in the day, New York Times, eBay, and others. Uh, they've been using uh, MongoDB because of the, the way it works. Features. Let's talk about features of MongoDB. It uses something called BSIN format, which is very JSON-like, right? So, um, and it stands for binary JSON. 
uh, which is a binary encoded serialization of JSON-like documents, so document-oriented again, right? And um, what this allows us to do is to create, uh, again, very low overhead, quick access documents uh, that we can have in a serialized uh, format. Very, very cool. One of the things that uh, Bison allows us to do is it creates something called an ID field uh, automatically for us, right? And it creates it by using a uh, structure. Usually what they do is create an, a, an object ID and this object ID, um, you know, as an example that you'll see as we do things today is made up of a four byte value representing seconds since the Unix epoch, three byte machine identifier, a two byte process ID and a three byte counter starting with a random value, uh, which is something how, how it creates this ID, which is kind of um, unique as an example to each document. So let's think about the, the analogy again. Documents are like records. Collections are a collection of documents. They're similar to tables. So that's the analogy from a NoSQL database to a structured uh, database, a relational database like MySQL, right? So when I talk about documents in your mind, you should think records, you know, because that's what, probably what you're used to. Uh, when I think about fields, well, fields or properties are the same. Fields and properties are the same in um, from a NoSQL or, or SQL uh, database. We talk about fields as well. That's the same thing, but collections and tables, collections and tables. That's the kind of uh, way we want to think about it. And it makes sense for collections, a collection of documents, a table of records. Okay, that's kind of how we think about it. We can have uh, nested documents as well. It's not just a matter of just having a... Uh, um, kind of a single document. You can have a document within a document, which makes sense, and that's how they do their um, relationships in some ways, right? You can create relationships. One thing to note, though, if you really are going to have a lot of relationships between one collection and another, right? So we have like two two tables, collections. You have a lot of relationships between them. It might suit you still to use a relation, uh, kind of um, a relational database. Why? Because why would you want to Kind of create all that structure from scratch kind of defeats the purpose of using a document oriented database right so if you have a lot of relationships a lot of stuff that you would normally use then you can still link to a mysql or sql server kind of database with express uh, and node it's okay there's still options for you to do that you don't have to do no sql it's just the trend right now to do that when there's a lot of there's not a lot of uh, overhead and the documents are very simple. For example, the things we're doing in our project for Lab 4, which is creating a contact list. All right, so um, we want to be able to do some kind of queries with MongoDB. And the way it works is instead of using something like this, select, you know, wildcard from posts, where post is the table, where title, the title field is like, and we do some kind of regular, you know, expression or something like that. We could simply do it like this. So we say, hey, database, we want to look inside the post collection and we want to find um, a title that matches the regular expression here that's inside of this um, object. That's how we do it, right? And this is the first part here in curly braces is called the filter. So we want to filter our, um, our search. And the filter usually has one or more properties that we're looking for for a match. Okay, so that's how it normally works. So very simple syntax. Um, it speaks to us, and it's very you know like again um, uh, kind of a chained uh, you know um, access similar to what we do when we have we have chained methods, one method after the other. But here it's like, hey database, MongoDB. That's what DB stands for. Hey, MongoDB, we're looking for the post collection. Inside the post collection, we want to find a title that matches Mongo. Okay. Um, so we can run the command in the shell. And before we move, move forward with more, more commands like that, let's take a step back and install MongoDB. So where do we get it? How do we do it? So I've given you a link for MongoDB here inside of your lecture section. Right, so there's MongoDB, you can click on that link. It'll take you here. Um, and what you wanna do from here is you wanna go to where it says software. On the left, there are several options. One of them that you wanna select is community server. So please click there. 
when you click on the community server, you'll see that you have a, an option here on the right hand side for different platforms and the package type and the version. I'm using a slightly older version than this, as you'll see in a second, but the way you do it is you select your version and then you select your platform. You can see that it covers quite a few different platforms. Right, so everything from Windows to Ubuntu, uh, SUSE, Linux, Red Hat, or CentOS, uh, those kind of things, Debian, Mac OS, uh, you know, and so on. And then the package type, if you want to do a, you know, kind of an installation package or a zip archive, it's up to you, then you download it. I've already gone ahead and done that. And I'm just going to pull it up for my uh, downloads right now. So I'm going to launch uh, MongoDB's installer. I'm not going to finish the installation, but I'm going to go through the steps with you. So here's what it looks like. So the first thing is you're going to take, be taken to this, right, where it's going to say, okay, hey, we're going to install MongoDB 4.44 as an example. I'm going to step you through the most important parts and tell you what not to do and what to do. And that's why I'm showing you this thing right now. So um, the next, you're going to click next. You're going to click accept over here and then click next again. Instead of doing complete, please don't do complete. Please select custom. Okay. Custom tells you these are all the things that we're going to install and where the installation path is. MongoDB server 4.4 as a good example. Um, then I'm going to click next. Okay. Now here in this step, welcome Jackie. In this step where you're looking here, notice that there is a, um, a process for installing MongoDB as a service, please uncheck this thing. I don't usually install MongoDB as a service. I don't want to add additional services to my Windows 10 load so or startup, so I don't do that, especially when it comes to gaming and other things. I don't like uh, service running in the background like this. I want to use the service when I feel like it and turn it off when I don't want to. So please do not check this. Okay, click Next. And then it says, by checking below, you, you agree to have this UI, which is MongoDB Compass. We're not going to really use it that much, so uncheck this, please. We're not going to use MongoDB Compass. And then click Next. And it's going to say, OK, I'm ready to install. Are you ready? Click Install. And then it should install MongoDB. OK, things to note. MongoDB's installation will not complete properly, or it will complete, but you may not still see it on the command line. As an example, if um, you, you, your um, system, your environment variables are in, you know, kind of messed up. So let's take a look. So if I go into to check your MongoDB installation worked, uh, after you install it, you would, you would issue a mongo minus minus version command on the command line. If you get something like this, mine's obviously 4.28, yours is not 4.28, it'll be 4.44, right? You'll get something that looks like this, okay? 4.28 or 4.44. And this is good. If you get unrecognized command, right, that means that you're, again, we have to modify your environment variables uh, to include the MongoDB uh, in your, on your shell. Also, one other thing to note is please make sure when you install Mongo, you stop any command line process. So if you have a, something else running in the background, a command prompt, close them down, close them Visual Studio Code, because that would be good uh, to make sure that that's done. So I'm just going to go back, and uh, if you have a problem, what do you do? Uh, as I say, you have to go into your environment variables. So you, what you want to do is you want to go to Advanced System Settings. So you type in Advanced at the uh, Windows button here. You click on Advanced System Settings, which will bring up this little dialog, right? And on the bottom, you'll see a Environment Variables link. This is the one you want to click on. And then it'll bring up uh, two types of environment variables. The um, uh, kind of local user variables and system variables. I want you to put the, you know, a reference to MongoDB in both paths. So in the path here, you want to put your reference to MongoDB. So C program files, MongoDB server 4.2 bin. Notice the bin folder is there as an example. Okay, so that's something you want. As well as you want to put it in the path here. Same idea, so you're going to go into uh, C, Program Files, MongoDB Server, 4.2 bin. Put it in both places, and then press OK, OK, and then it should fix your problem. Sometimes it will not. One other thing that you need to do, and i got to mention this as well, is there's a requirement when you launch, when you kind of install Mongo, in your uh, root folder. So if we look at our root folder, I'm just going to bring it up for a second. 
Um, there is, you need to in place a data folder. So here's, let's say my root of the C drive. I have a data folder. Inside my data folder, you need to put a DB folder. They can be both, the DB folder can be empty, but you need to have a data folder in your C drive on the root of your C drive and a DB folder inside the data folder. As long as you have this, you should be able to run your MongoDB um, server. If you don't have these two things, it will not work, okay? By the way, this works for Mac as well. You need to have a data, a data folder and a DB folder, whether you're a Mac or Linux user as well, okay? If you're doing it the way I'm doing it and not running it as a service. Okay, so now that I've got uh, my DB, my data and DB uh, folder, and there I've already installed Mongo, and I can do that, I can issue that command, Mongo minus minus version, I can do this, then I can issue, there's, there's two things that you need to run MongoDB. One is the MongoDB server. It runs on port 27017. So if I, and the way to run it is you, you kind of type in Mongod, or it's actually Mongo daemon is what it is. That's what it stands for. And if you kind of enter, you'll see that it brings up the server and it'll tell you that it's running on port 27017. Sometimes you get to run this a couple times. Uh, and the first time it'll make its hooks and the second time it'll run. All right. I find that that is the most common way of doing it. Okay, but you need to have a data DB folder in order for you to make this work. So this is the first piece. First piece is run your server locally. Okay. Second time, I'm going to run another command prompt. So another command prompt here. So I'm going to type it in. And now I'm going to type in the word Mongo by itself. No anything else connected to it. And I just want to, before I do that, I want to pull over my server so you can see that there's going to be an effect when I do this. So if I type in Mongo, Watch the server over here. It's kind of hard, but um, yeah, I'll pull it over so you can see over here. Once I type in Mongo and press Enter, right, you're going to see that the server responded. So this server responded with, hey, I got a connection, right? And I got a connection from a server shell uh, with a version. My client is using a version of 4.28. Type Windows, name, Microsoft, and so on, architecture x86-64, version 10 and the certain build. Okay, so that your server responds with, hey, I know that I have a client connected to me. Notice that I have this uh, greater than sign here. This is the command prompt that tells you that you're in, you're in uh, MongoDB. All right, so what I want to do is um, with Mongo, you can clear the screen. So clear screen command is CLS, similar to Windows. And then what you can do is you can do a show DBS command. Show DBS uh, basically shows you the databases that are installed. I have one that I created yesterday for us. It's called WebD6201. We're going to use the same database as the other uh, class uh, in this one. How did I do this? Well, the way to do this, whether you have a database or not, let's make a brand new database as a test. We'll call it um, WebD6201 tests, just to give you an idea. How do I do that? I need to use the use command. So I'll say use WebD6201, right? And then test, let's say one big name, and then press enter. And it's going to say switch to WebD6201 test. So how does it switch to something that doesn't really exist? Remember, if this is like JavaScript. When we make it, when we use it, it's created, OK? So we haven't really created anything. Because if I do a show DBS still, it doesn't show that database until we add a first record to it. So how do we do that? Um, what about collections? If I'm already in the database, I can do a show collections command as well. Collections are like tables, and we have no collections. No collections, no database, right? So I want to install or insert a, a piece of data. Let's ins insert something that is silly. So we'll say db. And then we just think up a name for a collection uh, that we want. So we'll call this. Um, you know, something like users, db.users, the users collection. And then I want to insert. You can do an insert, insert command. And the way the commands work is when you do an insert, you can open bracket, just like you're passing in something to a, a method, curly brace. And this is, remember, the, the first piece of data. All the data is in terms of a of an object and then a property. So my property might be you know, a uh, name, and then we'll put a, a value, which is Tom. And you can put your value, your name, okay? And then let's close it off. So I'm inserting a single document, 
That's what I'm doing. I have a single property with a single value, Tom, and then I'm pressing enter. And if I do that, it's going to say write results and inserted one, right? And then when I want to see it, I want to see the document. Now, if I do show collections again, you can see now I have a user's collections. If I go show DBS, you can see now I have this web D6201 test. It got created. As soon as I inserted the document, all those things got created. All right, next, I want to see the document that I made. How do I do that? I'm going to go db. So, hey, Mongo, I want to look inside of the users collection. So, Mongo, you're calling Mongo, db. And then you, the collection you want to look into. And then I want to find, that's my find method. And I, you need a filter, which is usually in, in the form of an object, right? So I say, okay, I want to find the name, right, uh, of, uh, you know, of, a, of an object that I've created and with a value of Tom, okay? So I'm looking specifically for that object and press enter and it's going to return this, okay? So that's a specific way of looking up one object, or if I want to find everything in the D in, in a particular collection, I can just say db.users.find and I see everything. Or I can also use the dot pretty ending, which is kind of a filter, db.users.find.pretty. And what that does is it prettifies um, kind of the output of the thing if there was more than just this. What about if I want to remove something? Um, well, let's add one more thing. So I'll say db.users.insert. We'll insert another user with a name of Joe, right? And remember, I need curly braces, so this won't work without curlies. I need curly braces because it's, it's an object. Let's say I insert Joe. So I have, I have another thing, and I'll do the, I can, I can tab up, uh, sorry, uh, arrow up, so I can repeat a command by arrowing up. So I can arrow up to db.users.findpretty, and I'm going to have two users. Tom and Joe, okay? Um, or if I wanted to tab up and just do find, it's gonna look the same right now because my user data is so small. Notice the way that the IDs got created. The only difference you can see, or the only increment is this, you know, uh, kind of um, everything else is fairly unique. It's different pieces that are the same, remember? But these pieces here are incrementing. So these are DA, DB, DC. It's gonna kind of go up like that. So it's not a, uh, a numeric index, it's something else, right, that we can use. Now, by the way, if you really wanted to, I could create an ID with a specific index. An example with this would be, I want to create two objects. And by the way, the collection doesn't care if it's homogenous or not. It doesn't care about being the same type of data. It doesn't care at all because it's just data that you're inserting. So example, if I say something like db.users.insert, and this time I want something else in my collection, Let's say I want to specify an ID of one, right? So there's my ID of one. And then I want to specify a name with a value of, you know, Peter. And I want to close that off. And if I press enter, it'll say inserted. And if I space up and do a find, you can see now that I can have an ID of one and not accept the automatic uh, created ID uh, that is here. And what this gives me is the flexibility uh, to create objects um, any way I like in the database. So there is no structure, there's no schema uh, that I have to follow. I mean, it's a convention that I wanna make everything similar inside of my collections, but it doesn't mean that every document has to be the same. They could be completely different. Um, and this is good and it's bad. It's bad for some people because they don't like uh, non no structure like this. Uh, it's good for people because, again, if you just want to store some simple information, no problem. Um, Mongo will allow you to do that. Okay, so how do I remove stuff? We're going to talk about this later in more detail, but I want to do db.users. I can do a remove, and I can specify something I want to remove. Like, for example, I want to find a user with the name of Peter, and I want to remove that. Let's see if remove works. So I do that. It says removed. And if I do, if I kind of uh, arrow up again and find, you can see that Peter is now gone, right? What if I want to remove the whole collection? I can do that. I can do db.users.drop. Now be careful because notice that remove didn't give me a warning and say, are you sure you want to remove something? No, it's just, if you don't, if you don't tell it what to do, it'll literally just, you know, remove stuff and it won't give you any 
warning or are you sure or none of that. All right, it'll just do it. Um, same thing with if I want to drop a whole collection. Whole, remember a collection is like a table. That means all documents in the collection will be dropped. And because it's the only collection, if I do this, it says true, bye bye collection. And if I do that, and if I do a show DBS, my web D6201 collection is gone. All right. So that is, oh, web D6201 test collection is gone or database. Why? Because without a one collection, a single collection, and if the collection doesn't have at least a single document, then what ends up happening is the, the whole database is wiped out. All right. So just letting you know, this is how it works from a high level. One more thing is if I wanted to look at another one, let's use another, let's look at another database. So use web D6201. I've created this yesterday. So here I'm switched. And if I want to DB dot, uh, first of all, let's show collections. We don't even know what collections we have. I have my contacts collection, which I'm going to add together with you. Um, and if I go into the contacts collection, and I go DB dot contacts dot find. You're going to see I have two contacts and I follow the same structure as I've done in my code. And we're going to follow this again. I have one a full name, an email address, and a contact number, and I've inserted this the exact same way that I showed you earlier. But now, because they're larger, I can field a different kind of command. I can do a, sorry, CLS. I can do a db.contacts.find.pretty, and you can see what pretty does. It kind of organizes it into something that looks like this, that's stacked, because I have more than one in piece of information. Um, and so it wants to show it in this way. That's what pretty does. It kind of stacks it on top of each other as opposed to uh, prints it long ones. Okay, so those are some simple commands that we're going to get back to. I'm going to pull this aside now because I just wanted to talk about MongoDB and the installation process and how to do simple commands before we move on. <clears throat> okay, let's continue. So that is MongoDB's installation process. All right, let's get moving and grooving. Um, while we're at it, you might as well, you know, one thing we're going to be using this semester for lab four, uh, as well as for uh, labs coming up, is MongoDB Atlas. So certainly we can do this local server. I can use uh, Mongo command and I can use the server on the back end to, you know, kind of uh, host my server. For testing, this is great. But if I wanted to share my database with others, um, or, you know, multiple people, I'm going to use some kind of online Mongo database. Before, uh, there was a project called MLab. Uh, that's what it used to be. MLab has transitioned to something called MongoDB Atlas. Again, you can try it for free. It's hosted on Amazon uh, Web Services. Uh, but if you sign up or uh, try for free, it's not, there's no cost to using this, especially when it's low. Um, so I'm going to sign in here. And let's see if I can put in uh, you know, kind of Tom at DurhamCollege.ca. And I can put my password in there and then click log in. And when I do that, uh, once I do that, it takes me to uh, something called a cluster. And for you, you'd have to create a new cluster by clicking this button when you do this. And later on, we'll go over how to set up MongoDB Atlas in more details. But one thing is, what you really want to do is set up a database. Okay, so you can see here I have, um, uh, I can look at command line tools if I really want to, or I can connect to this cluster. A cluster, think about a cluster as a container. That's what it is. And um, there's other things we can look, that, look at as well, but we're not going to look at that right now. I'm just looking at this cluster. If I click on cluster zero, I can see that there are, uh, different, it tells me I'm in Toronto, Canada Central, and so on. I can up, upgrade if I really want to and pay money. We're not going to do that because that's not really, we're just learning. You can see that the region is Azure Toronto when you set this up. And I'll set up a new cluster for you guys uh, very soon. But one thing to note is that each cluster, so if I go back, each cluster, and I don't expect you guys to do this right now. Um, if I go to collections, right, as an example, you can see that it's going to re kind of uh, return a set of databases and collections that I have, right? That's what it's going to do. Notice that online we're using uh, version 4.44. That's perfectly fine. I have a database that I've collected online, uh, connected online called uh, MyDB. 
And you can see that my DB uses a, um, a set, uh, a collection of contacts. And I have some examples here from before. This is from last year. We're going to make a new one. But notice how everything online seems to be very similar to what we did locally. Right. So we did something like this locally. Right. And you can see that, um, you can see that uh, online, right, the structure of what we did locally is very similar. And of course it would be because this is just an online version of a MongoDB database that we're going to have access to later on. So please sign up for MongoDB Atlas. We'll be using this uh, later on, tomorrow, probably tomorrow, starting tomorrow. And we'll set up a brand new cluster as well as a, a database and so on. And we'll go through the whole process, but I need you guys to sign up and register uh, for uh, MongoDB Atlas. Okay, so that is MongoDB Atlas and MongoDB. And now we're running into uh, continuously more queries with this. I'm going to continue with this as we move forward. So we talked about making queries. And uh, again, here's an example of a document. And let's say, suppose I want to find a all documents that have a, a specific um, a value of uh, comments. So I'll say I'm, I'm, I'm filtering for comments count. I can do that or I can filter for title. Notice I'm using the word filter, not search. I'm filtering for title or comments or comments count. And then if I want to, you know, present a search, I can do something like db.posts.find. So posts would be the collection. Okay. The collection goes here, just like we did the contacts collection or the test collection that we made. Um, users collection, uh, find. And then again, in curly braces here, the first curly brace around this is the object that is the filter. Okay. And then I'm putting in the property comments count, right? And then followed by um, some kind of value that I'm looking for. Okay. Now, in this case, I can use a, an object inside of this object that I'm searching. Dollar sign GT means dollar sign. It means greater than. That's what it means. So I'm looking for a comment count with a count that is greater than 10. That's what this means. Okay, and it'll return all posts with a comments, a comments count greater than 10. Okay, so that's what it'll do. And uh, here, I'm not again, I'm not going to read all this stuff uh, for you. It talks about things like uh, indexing and how to create a replica set. And this is all great and fun, but we don't, this is kind of out of scope of what we're using it for. Um, and it talks about the robust features of MongoDB and so on. Um, and how to, uh, you know, in order for us to create a, uh, a MongoDB replica set, how does this look and so on. We're not going to do that. How does sharding work? Again, this is just replication and backup, duplication and uh, location, as well as um, uh, other really cool features that included in Mongo to make it a very stable system is what this is. It also talks about Mongo 3, the re revolution of Mongo 3, which is where everything changed in 2015 and how it really improved everything. All right, so that's it. I'm not going to move. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much more about Mongo, but let's continue to talk about the Mongo shell really quickly. We talked about how we type in the word Mongo at the shell. As soon as we do, we'll have some kind of version here. You can see an older version of, of uh, Mongo on an old book, an old MacBook Pro. You can see that the version that was captured here was 3.06. Things have moved on since then. Um, and once we do that, um, you can say whatever you want. So if I go use, remember we did this, and the name of the database, we, in fact, are creating it. Okay, once we use that database and we add collections to the database, the database is created. We can also do a show DBS, which is show databases. That'll show you a list of databases. And then the first thing we want to do is insert something. It's what we do. Once we insert it into a collection, we create both the collection and the database at the same time, which is what I showed you. Okay. We can issue a db dot, dot whatever the collection is dot find to find all uh, documents in the collection. Okay. Again, a little bit of repetition, but it's okay. We can also then issue a show collections, which will show all the collections in my database. And like I showed you earlier, we can do a db dot whatever the collection name is dot drop, and it'll remove the database from uh, your, sorry, remove the collection from the database. If there's the single collection in the database, it'll also remove the database. So be careful about that. What about CRUD operations? What CRUD operations can I do with MongoDB? Well, we can do CRUD, remember, stands for create, read, update, and delete. Uh, in order for us to show you some of these things, and I want to get going with our code for in-class exercise 10, let's pull down our starter. 
So if we look at um, up on our DC Connect, we can see that uh, under the in-class exercise, we have a bit of starter. In-class exercise 10 starter is actually, if you want to see the um, last week's ICE 9A, all right, as an example. So please uh, pull this down. And if we go and do that, I'm going to, I'm going to show you my uh, desktop for a second. So there's my desktop under WebD6201. I have that. And here's the starter, 9A. I'm going to remove this or unzip it. And I'm going to make it so that we can use it, a usable version, which is going to be called um, Week 11B. And that's you guys, right? Week 11B is something that I want to pull into a my um, Visual Studio Code, right? Our trusty little editor, bring that in there. And once I've, I've done that, then I'm ready to go with everything that we had from last week with a bit of fixes. Guys, I'm so sorry, but I, um, it was a needle in a haystack trying to figure out what the problem was uh, with our server. So I've given you something that works. Okay, so... Um, so now that we have our some a uh, working server locally, let's run it to make sure that things uh, go okay. That's the first step we always do. And then we'll put this up on GitHub as a final version. So again, I'm gonna press Control Backtick for our server, our terminal in here. And what we're gonna say is, um, well, a couple things before we move on. Our package.json, let's move this to ice 10. And we'll also do the same thing here. So it says ice 10. This one will eventually be ice 10 B. That's you guys, right? That's where I'm going to store it. Ice 10 B. Um, you can put your author name in there, my node version and so on, uh, the server and so on. These are all the extra, uh, all the dependencies and the dev dependencies we had from last week, all the same stuff. Um, we are going to also run, um, uh, TypeScript. So we're going to get there in a second, but I'm going to go back to readme.md. And also change this to 10B, which is what you guys are, 10. All right, so that is everything that we've changed. Um, let's make sure we also save our package.json and let's put this up on GitHub. So git init, git add dot. Git commit minus M initial commit. Yes, these are the standard things we've done in the past. We want to put this up on GitHub, so we need a Git repository that's made for us. We don't have one yet, but we're going to make it right now. So we're going to click New, and we're going to say public WebD 6201 in the winter 2021 semester, and it's week, or sorry, ICE 10B is what I want to make. I made it. And once I have the container, the repo container online on GitHub, we can grab the last three lines of code here, copy them, go back to uh, VS Code and right click, and that will allow us to paste everything in and connect to our uh, GitHub repository. And that will be our final. Let's put this up as a link. So refresh this. And we can grab this link. So here is the link. Go into DC Connect. And inside of our in-class exercise, we can create a new link for you guys to follow, which is in-class exercise 10 final. Let's do that. So create a link. And then in-class exercise 10 final. Okay, and we'll open this as an external resource. Nice, nice. Excellent. Let's also do it for the other people in the other course, in the other uh, section, just to make sure that they're watching and they're doing everything right too. And then we'll move on. Okay, so we're just going to do this kind of a, a upfront cost to what we're doing here because I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So again, I'm just going to make a new link, and then in class exercise ten, fine, All right? Which will give everyone a kind of uh, level playing field when it comes to the stuff you guys are doing. Okay, so good. Let's go back to us, which is where section two, and let's uh, go into what we've done before. So now that we have everything uh, locally here and we have a file, it's up on GitHub. Hopefully you guys are with me on that. Um, we want to kind of issue commands to connect to um, to our database, right? But first let's run what we have. So again, I'm going to issue a 
a clear command, right? There we are. And then I want to run it. So again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a uh, node mod, but before that, I'm gonna do control shift B. Control shift B is gonna run my task runner, which is gonna allow me to select either a build task or a watch task for TypeScript. All right, so I'm gonna click on TSC watch. And TypeScript watch is gonna bring up the watch task, right? I'm gonna go into my command prompt and type in nodemon. Uh, one thing I heard, and I, I had a question was like, I don't know how to use light server with your express. You can't use light server with express. People have been asking me that question and light server is express. It's like a little express server. You can't run an express server from an express server guys. So you need to use something like nodemon uh, or uh, forever. There's other, other little apps that you can use too. So you can see now that I've launched Nodemon, we can go into our uh, kind of our site. We can go localhost 3000 and you should see this. Okay, so it's kind of the same stuff we had last day with all these things. Nothing different here for you guys. Okay, so please make sure that it's running for you as it's running for me. So that's step one. Step two is I want to add some additional functionality. So how do we connect to MongoDB locally or even remote when we have an express server. Well, we're going to use a little um, module, a package that's online called Mongoose. So Mongoose is a uh, object relational mapper, uh, a, you know, a ORDM or a uh, kind of like that. And what it does is we, it's another package from NPM and we're going to use Mongoose to connect to Mongo. Okay, that's the our package we're gonna use. It's a very common package. I would say it's probably the most popular package to connect to MongoDB, okay? So let's do it. So one thing we need to do is we need to issue another command. I'm gonna go in to add another little uh, kind of command prompt in here. And we can just go something like uh, yarn add and then mongoose, right? And when I do that, it's gonna install mongoose, the latest version with all of its dependencies, as you can see, inside of our um, package.json file. There it is. I also want to add in some code hinting, right, for uh, Mongoose, right? So I want to say yarn add at types slash Mongoose and then minus minus dev, which adds uh, Mongoose to dev dependencies. Right, so we can actually have some good code hinting here as well. All right, so those are kind of uh, two things that we get with Mongoose and uh, and how do we set it up now? And let's talk about this. So I'm going to go into our structure, our site structure here, and notice that I've added 750 files. Uh, Mongoose is a very complete uh, system of connecting to MongoDB. Right, so one thing we need is a couple things. We have a model, we're gonna add a schema later on. We're gonna talk about what a schema is, but we're also gonna add in a configuration package. So one, we, one thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say that I want a new folder. I wanna call the folder config. Okay, in my config folder, um, I want to add a new file and I wanna call this db.js. Actually, let's make it ts because we're gonna do a TypeScript file, right? In our db.ts, we're going to say let db or our database path. You can also say something like Mongo db path, right? To make it very descriptive for you, is equal to something, all right? Because we have to connect locally to something. Now, if you look online, right? Even back to what we said, it kind of shows you what it looks like. Mongo db colon forward slash forward slash localhost. You don't need the port unless you have a, you've installed Mongo on a different port, MongoDB. And then the name of your database. We have a database that we're gonna create called WebD6201. All right, so that's what it's gonna be called. So again, it's gonna, it's gonna be, hey, MongoDB, right? Colon, forward slash, forward slash, localhost, right? Forward slash, the name of your database, which for us is gonna be WebD6201. Okay, that's gonna be the name of our database. And that is our database, our local path to our database. By the way, in the future, we're gonna have a MongoDB path that points to MongoDB Atlas. And I'm gonna give you driving instructions on how to do that tomorrow, okay? But locally, we wanna test as well. 
Why? Because it's quick and we can figure out problems without having to troubleshoot two different servers online. That's why we do it locally. All right, so that's the first thing. The other thing is we want some kind of session secret a lot of times. So sec session secret, um, as an example, might be another piece of data. And we can call this, I don't know, some secret. And usually the session secret is a way of us uh, kind of uh, encoding our session with uh, almost like an API key. That's what that kind of works out to be. Okay, so those are two pieces of data. Notice the just data. And why would I separate this into a config file? Well, there's no point making this happen or exposing this inside of our app.ts. We want to keep our app.ts fairly clean. So now what we can do is we can export it. We can do a module.exports. Okay, a module.exports. And when we do a module.exports, um, we can point to whatever we want. We can make a kind of an anonymous object where I can say something like db is equal to right uh mongodb path right i can do that and then separated by session secret which is uh i could actually call it just secret let's say so i'll say secret is equal to session secret right and so all i'm doing is relating this to this and this will be our exports remember our module exports it basically says this is our module pattern for node it will export anything that we tell it to i can even create a function like whatever I want. Let's say, for example, I want to make a function, right? Um, you know, something like console log, this function does nothing, right? Okay, so there's my little function and I want to add that in too. I can say, you know, uh, <clears throat> I can call it dot, uh, you know, uh, uh, nothing, right, is my function right? Where nothing is the name of the, the variable that I'm assigning my function to. Okay. Notice that it, it glows yellow, right? It's different than white. White is like variables and then yellow is functions. I can do this. I can export as many things I want. Or if I don't want to go with this, remember module that exports a bit of a review. So this is one way of doing it, right? The other way, it's not what I wanted to do. The other way of doing that is, um, <clears throat> well, I meant, the other way of doing that is um, doing it like individual. So I can say module.exports dot, and the name of the thing I want to export, for example, db, and I can say that that equals to uh, mongodb path, or module dot exports, right, dot, and then, I don't know, secret, and that's equal to session secret. It'll actually add these properties onto the exports, um, the exports object, right? It's kind of like a bag, a holding bag, if you will, uh, of properties. That's what it does, right? So I can add as many things I want. I can even add that little function if I wanted the same way, module dot exports dot whatever the function is called, nothing function. We'll call it that for now as an example. And it'll be my function. We totally can do that. And that's totally fine. Uh, you know, it's it, this is great a great way of doing it as well. It's okay if this makes more sense for you. You can even do it as you go. So you can say something like module.exports is equal to right underneath each one. It doesn't matter how you do this as long as you have at least one module.exports uh, line in your uh, your module. Okay, so this is something that we want to be able to do. Um, I did it differently last day, but I'm probably going to go with something that looks like this. I think this is kind of more established. You'll see this a lot, but this will be fine. I don't care about my function, but I'll I'll show you how this works in a second. <clears throat> and I'll remove my function afterwards. So now that I have access to, I have my config, I can add this into my app.ts. And what I can do is here's my configuration. Um, and this is kind of my uh, my app configuration, right? I can also call, I can create my uh, DB configuration. Okay, there's my DB configuration area. I need to include mongoose here. So let's do that. So we'll say import mongoose. And that is equal to require mongoose, okay? Like normal. So mongoose. So now that I have mongoose, I can do stuff with it. 
But what I can do is in my DB configuration, I can say that, uh, well, let's do a let um, DB config. We can say that DB config. Um, I can say that that is equal to require. Remember, I can just link my other file together. And I'm sitting inside of my app.ts. So I just have to go to dot slash and then config slash. I don't need the, the, the JS, dot, just DB. Right? So that is my DB config. Right? And DB config now basically is a, an object <clears throat> that is the representative of everything that's inside of the uh, config.db uh, file. All right, so let's look at that. If I want to do a console log, as an example, and if I just uh, do a db config, db config uh, output, and if I run it, so if I save it, and because I'm running Nodemon, if I want to look at the output of that, right, you can see that down here, I actually get the output. There's our object right here. Okay. So that is how it works. You import it, you import something with a require statement, even if it's another file, you link it to your database configuration, right? And then you can do something with it. In this case, I'm just outputting the whole thing. What about if I only wanted to output one thing? I can go db dot, and because db has objects, I can say db dot db, right? db config dot db, the database uh, path. If I save that, you can see that I'm only getting out the database path now, right? What if I want to say db dot, you know, something which is, uh, it's called nothing, right? db dot nothing. I want to call nothing. Well, how does that work? If I save that, and if I do that, you can see that it says this function does nothing, and then it says undefined. <laughs> if I just did this right by itself, db dot nothing, right? It's just going to output that it's a function, but I need to do a function call, right? Why it does undefined? It doesn't do anything, so it doesn't know what to do afterwards. So if I did this db config dot nothing, it actually outputs what it says to do, right? So that's what the that's how the functions work. I can actually call a function that I created in another module. All right, and um, but let's not do the function call stuff, and let's remove the function from our our config. We don't care about this in our config .ts because we're never going to have a function called nothing, right? And let's just get rid of this. But we do want our session secret and our MongoDB path. Um, for example, sometimes a DB, maybe you want to call that DB path. That's more uh, kind of descriptive as opposed to um, what it is. And also instead of, um, or, or just path, if you wanted to do path, because it's configed, you know, dbconfig.path, right? dbconfig.secret. That's how it'll look, right? So it makes more sense. All right, so now that we have this configuration, now we can go back to our app.ts and do some connect connection to it. Let's go back online and see what it tells us to do. So again, I'm looking at the mongoosejs.com uh, link, and I have this link available to you inside of your DC Connect. And if you notice here, I have a uh, mongoose, and then I do a mongoose.connect. Okay, mongoose.connect. So I want to issue that right here. I want to do a mongoose.connect and I want to connect to, notice it says URIs. So it's going to be dbconfig.path. That's what I want it to connect to. If I just did this and if I press enter, it's going to work, but I'm going to get these deprecated deprecation warning errors. Why? Because we need to add in a couple of new pieces, two new options which are these options right here. So if you actually go right here and grab these two options right from the, the main website, it'll solve the deprecation uh, issue. Just call that up and then put that in here and then you're good to go. So this is our configuration. And if I save this now, it's just gonna, those warnings are gone, okay? Again, what it says is you use new URL parser true and use unified topology true. Once I've done these two things, I'm connected to Mongo, but there's no, message that tells me that I've connected. I need a message, some kind of way of doing that. And the great thing about Mongo, uh, Mongoose is it has a, uh, a way of showing that you're connected. So let's look at the, uh, the documentation. There is a, notice it says a quick start guide. Let's go to quick start guide for this. It talks about a bunch of stuff. One of them is a schema. How does that look? 
how do I define a schema? What is a schema? We're going to get back to that in a second. What is a model? And so on. Um, but it also talks about uh, connection. How do I connect? Here's my connection. Um, how do I set up a connection? What does that look like? It tells me about that. There's also a quick start guide to show me how to connect. And there's also a way of, of showing you how to create a, uh, a uh, event so that you can detect when you're connected or not. So I want to do this. Right, so again, I got that from Quick Start. Scroll down, and there is some uh, a bit of a connection script right here, just right in the top. But what we need to do is we need to kind of make a reference to the connection. All right, so let's grab all this, go back to our code, and press it in. Right, so here we're saying our DB, our database, and is mongoose. So we still have mongoose. We've defined mongoose way up here, right? Mongoose.connection, right? And then I'm saying on, now you can remember on from jQuery or something else. On error, then I want every time we have an error, then output the error to the console. That's what it does. And but what about when we're successful? When we open, then what I want to show is we're connected. So we, do, we can do a console log. And I can use backtick right for this and I can say connected to MongoDB at and then you can put in a um, again this is a template string we can uh, show what we're connected to and I want to use the DB path so I can say DB config dot path right so that is the configuration that we can use if I, if I put a curly brace or sorry a, a semicolon there and press save what it's going to do is it's going to show us immediately that we're connected to MongoDB. But it's only going to do it once. If you really want to show this more than once, you can do that. Okay, so on connect. Open is one uh, uh, event type, but you can use several different kinds of events here instead of just open. Let me pull this down a little bit. Um, so what are the different connection types? So under guides, when you see connections, right, you can see that there's also so guides, connections, then you want to look at connection events. So if you look at connection events, there are different kinds of connection events. So you can look at connecting. So I'm attempting to connect to a server. I'm connected. That's another event. I've opened, which is equivalent to connected. So these two things are the same. I'm disconnecting. I'm in the process of shutting things down. I've finally disconnected, right? You know, um, and so on. I've reconnected. If I'm disconnected and reconnected, I have an error, right? And so on. So these are all the different kinds of events, and we want to at least have the connect event. We want to show that we're connected to the server, right? Um, if we're not connected to the server and we try and access it, it's not, it's going to fail. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. All right, so that is a, a very simple way. We've done our connection. Let's put this up on GitHub. So again, I'm going to go to my command, and I'm going to say issue a git at dot. You can see there's a lot being added here because of our mongoose git commit minus m and we'll say added mongoose right git push so we've connected to github and added mongoose awesome all right are you with me i know some of you joined late um i got some questions here so we just have to create a path variable Okay, Nick got it to work. I'm looking at uh, at, uh, at YouTube here just to make sure it's good. Yes, you need an underscore for sure. And you can wait wait until we do the cluster stuff. If Nick signed up for um, MongoDB Atlas, wait, we'll do it together, Nick. Yeah. All right, so that is uh, very good. We've got everything. Um, Kind of connected now and that's the first step but we need some additional work here notice that i have a, a bit of a database i need you guys to recreate this uh together with me so again how would you do that i'm just going to drop this and do it from scratch right so remember that i want full name email address and contact number because this this is what our contacts look like all right so again what you want to do is you want to go um, I want to use WebD6201, so now you can switch to it, and then you want to insert into the into a collection that right now does not exist for you. So I'm going to insert a couple more things: db dot 
whatever the collection is called. In my case, I'm going to call it contacts dot and then insert and then what I want to insert. Now remember, I don't care about the ID. It's going to generate it for me, but I do care about full name. That is my how I'm going to structure things. I, you don't have to do this, by the way. Remember, uh, MongoDB doesn't care. You can It'll take whatever you give it. All right. But for now, I'm going to give it full name and I'm going to make, uh, you know, kind of Tony Stark here. Right. And then I'm going to make an email address or, yeah, I think that's the second one. Email address and contact number. Email address. So Ironman at example.com. And as well as a contact number, contact number. So again, we want to do 416-555-5557, making this up. And curly brace and then parentheses. All right. That is a new uh, document that I'm inserting into the context collection. Then press enter. And now it says inserted one. If I do a db.contacts.find, then you're going to see that I have three. You can enter a couple more for yourself, but you need to have at least one, please. Okay? I've entered a few, and if you want to look at it nicer, you can do a db.find.pretty, which actually looks much nicer if you do it this way. It shows you a bunch of stuff. One thing is, notice that um, I did these yesterday, so it had 9-0 and 9-1, but notice that my full name for my Tony Stark uh, entry is different. The ending is different. Why? I entered it in on a different day, and because I entered it in a different day, it has a different ending altogether than what we had before. It doesn't even look the same at all. Uh, you know, not even this part, right? So, and it doesn't matter. Remember, we don't care about the ID. It's just an identifier for us to be able to access the uh, document inside of the collection anyway. All right, so now that we've entered at least one document in the collection, we can actually think about building something called a schema. I'm going to go into the models folder that we have here, and I'm going to go and create a new document. I'm going to call this the contact.ts uh, file, contact. This is not like a contact class, okay? But it's going to be very similar to the way we're going to use it. So the way this works is I want to insert or I want to get, um, you know, kind of my mongoose uh, reference here as well and add, uh, use Mongoose again. And where do you get uh, a reference for this? Let's go back up to Mongoose and go to schemas. And if I, when it says defining my schema, it looks like this. This is how a schema would look like, okay? So again, I'm into guides, schemas, right? And notice it says import Mongoose from Mongoose, right? And you can see that, um, here is a really nice way of doing it. So let's do that right now. Now, one thing it says, it says const schema is equal to mongoose. This is not a bad way of doing it because then I can use it. Okay, let's do that. So notice also that it's using the from mongoose as opposed to import mongoose equal to require mongoose. We'll talk about the advantage and disadvantage of doing this in a second. So let's do that. So if I go import mongoose, right, and then Notice it says from mongoose. If I go from mongoose, is that okay, right? Can I do this? And it says, hmm, don't know what you're doing here. Um, it says I'm doing mongoose in a, in a TS contact, but I don't know what's happening. Well, the reason why this isn't working nicely is because um, it's not playing nice is because of my tsconfig.json file. So I want to put a uh, module resolution of and I want to switch this to node, all right? I want to add that module resolution of node in the back here. And, and when I do this, it changes the way that um, I want to put this in. And we're going to also uh, convert this uh, a little bit later on as well. Uh, module pattern also, we, we want to mess with this too much because this is the way uh, my modules connect, right, inside of my client. So be careful when we're connecting modules to the client. We're using common JS for this. Uh, remember, there's other options in, in the module pattern as well. But for now, module resolution is going to be node. If I go back to my contacts, still I'm having this issue. It says mongoose is declared, but the value is never read. That's okay. It's just a warning. Let's see if we can continue. 
with what it says. Okay, so the next part is it says const schema. So schema. And then it says take the schema object. That's what it is. And I want to make it equal to mongoose. So equals to mongoose. Okay, now I've used it, but now it says Man, mongoose has no default export. Not yet. We will, right? And and then it tells me to create a uh you know a kind of schema. We're gonna make a um contact schema. So we're gonna say const contact schema is equal to a new schema type. All right. And what I want to do with this one is my schema type is going to be whatever I want it to be. Let's just put these to make it look like this. Don't worry about the structure. I like it this way because I can separate my I separate it from myself and it makes sense. You can see that if I hover over, it says contact schema is declared but is not used, right? Um, and however, if I did this, right, you can see that it's of type any, right? So we got some issues here and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about fixing them in a second. Um, I'm using the just the words that it's showing online, and I'll show you the fixes in a, in a bit. Okay, so this is nice, but issues. Okay, and let's and this is I'm trying to work with the documentation that you see, just in case you do it. So the thing is, I want to have these things that we added before. We want to have these properties: full name, email address, and contact number. That's what we want as a schema, right? Schema again. Do you have to use a schema with with uh, uh, a MongoDB? No, but we're going to. So we're going to say something like the first one is going to be called full name, followed up by the type string. So it's really almost like a blueprint that we're creating or a class. And then I want to say email address, uh, which is of type string, as well as the last part, which is contact number, which is also of type string. Okay, so those are the three things we need. And if I save this, and if I go hover over again, you see that this doesn't really give me much of what this is. So that's something that we can do. What if I did it some in a different way? What if I didn't use this format? Okay. And I said something like const schema is equal to mongoose dot. And I want to use schema here. What if I did that instead? Right. So mongoose dot schema. And you can see now that again, it points to nothing. But if I was to do import mongoose, and instead of from mongoose, I said equal to require. So again, using the uh, the way we're doing it with node mongoose and press enter, right? So it's going to all of a sudden start resolving. And I'm going to get code hinting here. I'm going to get heavy code hinting. This is what I want you guys to do. So contact schema is going to be the type. And now I'm getting code hinting. I'm getting it from um, using the require pattern. Uh, for Node.js. We'll, we'll talk about another way of doing this another day, but for now I want you to stick with this, this the simple pattern of doing stuff. All right, next, we want to, once we have our contact schema, we want to create a model from the schema. So again, if I go back to our documentation, it tells me that I've got this. Um, I've got a schema now. One thing we can also add with the schema, there's also other additional things. By the way, these are all the permitted schema types string, number, date, buffer, boolean, and so on. We're gonna add other ones later on for ourselves, right? What we wanna also do is we wanna create a model. So for example, let's say we have a model called blog. We wanna use mongoose.model. We wanna name it, friendly name for the, mo for the model, and then point to the schema that we're connecting to. Let's do that here. So we're gonna say const, and we're gonna call this the uh, uh, model. I'm just going to call it model, right? So const model, because remember, we're in the contact uh, the contact uh, file, right? So it's going to be, it's going to look like this, contact.model, right? That's why I'm calling it model instead of contact.contact model. I don't need to do that. Contact.model is enough. Model is going to be equal to mongoose.model. You can see that that comes up. And then it, it's asking for a couple of things. The name of the model. So we're going to call this contacts, the contact model, right? And then the schema that's related to it, which is my contact schema. There we have a model now. And if I hover over model, you can see that it is a mongoose model. All right. 
So think about this as a structure. A schema is a structure or a blueprint that I'm using to connect to, um, to MongoDB. Okay, that's what I'm doing. So that's what this looks like, okay? So far, so good. Excellent. All right, and now that we've got this, and uh, we've got this, we still need a, an export statement, and we're gonna do that. We're gonna say something like module.exports.model is equal to model. Now, could we have done this in one line? Absolutely. I'm separating it for you for understanding purposes. Remember, I can have more than one of these. I could also do this, right? That's equivalent to what I just did, except here I have an object and here I don't. So, sorry, it wouldn't be like this. It would be like this, all right? I could do the same thing. That's, that's equivalent. But for now, all we're going to have is one exports, which is going to be the model that I want, right? And we're going to use, we're going to point this to model. Okay. So that is uh, the way we're going to connect uh, uh, to it, right? So I'm going to save this. And this is going to, if you look at contact.js, it kind of works nicely. It kind of does everything that we want to do. Um, we're using const here and everything else. It accepts everything and we're good to go. We just, what it does here in the contact.js, it removes any comments as well as any spaces. So it kind of makes it look nicer. Awesome. So now that we have a model, this is good, but let's add one more thing to the schema. The schema also allows us to do other things. So if I press control, so schema options, control space, we can also specify a bunch of things. One of the things I like to also specify is the collection that I want to go into. So if I press collection, we can specify that the collection is the context collection. All right, so this is the collection in the database. So when we connect to the database, we're going to say, look in the context collection here. Okay, that's what this is saying. Okay, and by the way, if you want more information about uh, anything that we've asked for here, so for example, if you go to IDs, if you want to look at uh, different instance methods on how to do that, and so on, um, I'm just going to look at options because it has virtuals and it has a bunch of ways of creating things, aliases, and here's options. One of them is the collection option, and it shows you what this looks like. So collection is data. We just put that option at the end. Okay. All right. So that is the the way we uh, we use Mongoose to connect and create a mo uh, a model, which is my contact model, my contact model. All right. Let's put this up on GitHub. So I'm going to say um, git add dot git commit minus m. And we're going to add a new model. We're going to say added the uh, contact model, right? And then git push. So that added mod the contact model in the models folder. Now, how do we use the contact model? So once we made it, right, how do we use it, right? Well, um, what I want to do is I want to be able to use the find uh, option, right? I want to be able to find elements inside of the database, right? So where do we do that? Well, we do it in routes, right? Here's our routes. And right now, uh, you know, again, what I want to do is if I go to my index.ts, then you can see that I have several routes and we have some temporary routes down here that we created last week, right? Temporary routes we have is a contact list, which gives us a contact list, but only if I'm logged in. I'm going to comment this one out. I want to still go to my contact list, but instead of res render, I want to do a res.json in a second. Okay, so this is what I want to do, my contact list. But in order for me to get my contacts from my database, instead of you know how I did it before, which is inside of that data folder, right? So I had a client data folder and I had um, some context.json here as an example, or I also had a data folder, uh, sorry, a, um, I used a local storage for this as well, right? Whether I do it from here or whether I get it from somewhere else, as an example, um, I want to have access to, you know, uh, you know, all this stuff from the database, not from some mock folder, right? 
So how do I do that? Let's go back to my router routes index.ts. At the top, I kind of install Express, right? So this is kind of Express config. We'll say this is Express configuration, right? But we also want to get my model, right? So we'll say that contact model. And the contact model is going to be, uh, I need to requ require it, right? So again, it's going to be something that looks like this. I'm going to say const or import. It's up to you. Const, let's use const. If I, would do, if I was to do const, and if I call this contact, right, contact model, if I said my contact model, right, if I did this, um, contact model and contact are two different things, right? So let's, let's think about this for a second. If I said contact model is equal to require, now how do I get to my models from my routes? I have to go up one. So I'm going to say this is my path, up one, into models, down into contact, right? Then that is going to give me uh, information about my contact model. All right, notice that I'm not getting any code hinting. What if I did an import? Can I do an import? And I can. Right, uh, but what happens is I may not get any information anyway. Okay, I'm just letting you know, right? Because we're having a problem with our node, and fix it. So one thing, if I use import or whatever, that's one. If then I can say something like const contact is equal to my contact model dot model, right? Because that is linked contact model. Model is linked into my contact model, and that's why I don't want to use import. I want to use const because then it'll give me some error, pokey error in um, in TypeScript. But this is working great. So how did I get this? And it doesn't detect it or anything. Well, let me go back to my uh, model again. So again, if I look at the model, let's split screen it so we can see it in in kind of uh, more definition here. So I have in my contact model. I contact, I export a model object, and it's connected to this. I've created a model, and I've I've stored it inside of my model uh, variable, right? This is the identifier for the container. And then I'm saying that the exports object, I've attached a model object to it, and it's pointing to, as a reference, to the model that I created up here, okay? So when I reference it down here, I'm saying I'm making an alias here for my contact. My contact is equal, actually equal to the model, right? But I don't want to call it contact model over every single time, or I want to, I don't want to go contact model dot model. I just want to call it contact. So this is an alias. So this is the contact alias. Okay, that's what it is. I'm just making it so it's easier for us to use, but not required to be to be done that way. You can make it any way you like. All right, cool. So now that I have a contact and it's a contact model, I can use it, right? So down in here, um, inside of my res render, right? I want to first do access to my contact. So I'm going to say, hey, I want to use my contact model and I want to find, remember how we did find? I want to find everything from my contact model. That's what I kind of want to do, right? So where do I get the code hinting for this. All right, so let's go back to Mongoose and let's see how I can connect. Let's go to Quick Start Guide. So you can see that I have this and I'll make a model. And then what I want to do with the model is I want to do a find, right? So I want to do, I can do save, but I can also do something called find. And notice what I get when I do find. I have to find something. So I can find, I can look for something to find or I can find generally, right? Notice that the way it works is I can have a filter object or not, right? Followed by a, just like we did in MongoDB, followed by a callback function. And the callback function in this case is the only thing we care about because we don't want to filter, we want to get everything. Let's output this right now. So that means I can do a contact.find. I don't want to filter, but I want to have a function and I want in my function, I want to have two pieces, my error as well as my data, right? So there's my data. We can also call this, we know that we're finding all contacts, right? From my data and contacts are going to be a collection, right? So we know it's an array or some kind of collection. 
Okay, so that's that's one thing. And then what we want is for it to trigger something that looks like this. Okay. And so when I load, I find everything, I want to kind of get everything from my, my data. What about if I have an error? If I have an error, I want to log it, right? I want to log, oops, I want to log my error. So this is kind of where I want to go. Just like it says here, if, you know, error, then I want to return my error to the console, console.error, right? Whatever the error is. So return console.error. And I want to pass out the error. So I see what the error is that I, if I can't connect to it, right? Um, and the reason why we're getting errors here is because this should be an error, right? And what is contacts? Contacts is an object. So for now, we could we could call it what we want. We're going to get an object and say that it is an object. That's what we're going to get back, right? So what if I don't get an error? Then I want to res uh, and I want to, uh, you know, response with JSON. And what it says is, what is the body of my file that I'm going to get? I can pass in contacts. Okay. So response.json, instead of response render, response render, what it does is it renders a page. I don't want to render a page. I just want to put push all the contacts out to my page. Hey, let's also do a console log contacts as well. Let's put output this to the console as well as to the page. If I did this, and if everything goes well, and if I go control back tick, and if I look at my node, then you'll see that when I go to my contact list page, you'll see stuff here. Let's try that. So I'll go here. I'll go into my contact list page. So again, I'll go localhost 3000, and I'll put in slash contact dash list. If I press enter, I should get all my contacts listed here. Okay. Same time, I'm also getting my contact listed here, right? So this is the contacts that are being listed in the console, and this is the contacts that are being listed on the page. So what the heck happened? What did I do? And why? How did this all work? Well, let's review re one more time, and then we'll stop for today, right? So I don't want to overload you with everything that we've done. So a couple things, right? Let's go back to that model that we did. We said, hey, model, I want to make a new schema, right? This Mahmoud Mongoose. And the schema is a blueprint for what um, I'm looking for, how I'm going to save stuff and load stuff from the database. This is a way of me deserializing data that's coming from the database. I've serialized it in a specific way. I've kind of put in a full name, email address, and contact number. Notice I don't care about the ID right now. I could. I could put an ID here as well, but I don't need to, right? So full name, email address, and contact number I've got. And then I want to be able to load stuff into uh, or use my, my schema, this contact schema, to look into the database and to identify different fields that are BSIN, that are encoded in this way, and then read it in somehow. I'm also pointing to the contacts collection because that's the collection that I created. Do I have to do this? No, it'll find it for me but it gives it a chance, it get, makes it easier for, uh, for Mong Mongo to figure this out. Okay, this is great. Um, let's also go into the next part. So once I've got this schema created in my routing, which is where I do my work, I have to include it. I have to say, first of all, hey, let's make a connection to the contact schema that's inside of my models folder. So I've done that and I've included it here. So this contact model, is a reference for the module.exports um, object, right? That also includes a model property, which is what I did here, right? So model property that points to a ref as a reference to the mongoose model right here. Okay, that's what I've done. This points to this. Okay. And then once I've done that, I require it. So this actually is a reference to the contact model, right? What I want to say is contact as an alias, instead of going contact.model every single time like this, right? 
I just want to say contact is easier to use. So my contact then um, is a as an object, and I'm going to use this as my model. Good, excellent. Well, because contact now is a mongoose model, contact has all the functionality that you'd be you'd be um, you know uh, comfortable with when it comes to how we just made some simple commands work on Mongo, right? So on Mongo, I can do a you know db.contacts.find, right? Which is kind of what I'm doing here. I'm saying, hey, go to the contacts uh, for, uh, collection, and I want you to issue a find command. And I'm not finding anything, right? And and if I do that, if I do this and I press enter, you're going to see that it gets the data, right? The data is going to be stored somewhere. Well, how is that being stored? It's going to be stored into this contacts object. That's what it's going to be done. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking this contacts object, right? And with it, I am outputting to the console, or I'm going to send it to this to the page with a response dot JSON. By the way, response.json is a great way of using my Express server as an API where I return JSON and it's consumed by some kind of front end single page application like Angular or React. Okay, that's kind of how I do it. All right, I know I went over that a couple times, but this is the first step into making this work properly. Other things to explore, all right, that we're going to have to work with. How do we make TypeScript get, get good code hinting from Node? So TypeScript and Node. How do I do that, right? So it says, how do I set up a uh, Node project with TypeScript? And this is DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is a local uh, server. It talks about using static typing and la 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 la. Um, we also install our dependencies and so on. Notice that the module stays as uh, CommonJS. Right now, one thing it says is ES module interop is true. Target is ES6. It's fine. Module re resolution is node. And that's the only thing. So the only thing we've changed is uh, that um, the uh, ES module interop. Right. I think we can try this. I don't think it's going to give us much, but let's try it out and see what it does for us. So grab that and let's go back into our own. Thing and going to our tsconfig.json, and we can put that in there as well. So comma doesn't matter the 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 uh, the order by the way. Save. Okay. So do we get a um, any kind of code hinting, which is what we're looking for, guys? All right. So again, if I go back into my um, my routes, the code hinting that I'm looking for is when I use uh, Node. If I hover over contact, it doesn't give me any. It gives me my model. I'm not seeing that. Contact model doesn't give me anything. It gives me any. That's not good. All right. Let's go back to the little document, what it shows us here. All right. So, la la la. We initialize everything. Um, this is TSLint. We don't, we don't care about that right now. Here's my package.json, which is exactly what we're doing. Notice it just says types at types. Everything else that we've done is here. And then we want to run and create a basic server. We're using import statements. This is nice, nice, right? And this is everything that we've done. Um, it, this is the uh, transpilation, and this is it. So nice, but we're not getting any type hinting from uh, node modules. So that's kind of one thing. We, we've already done this, right? So TypeScript node and express. Let's do one more. So this is another uh, thing. Again, I'm just searching for, uh, for how this works, right? So again, similar to what we've seen before, one thing to note is that they also they always include a um, now here they're using const express um, with TypeScript. And here the compile options are target ES6. We're using one thing we're using instead of ES6 is ES 2015. And just to be clear, sometimes remember uh, Node.js is different than regular. Here I'm using ES2015 because that's what I've chosen. Let's use ES6 just because that's what it's telling us to do, right? Not because I think it's going to make any difference, but let's see if this is going to help us, right, with code hinting. This is important, right, because that's, the, that's what I'm looking for, code hinting. Again, under routes, if everything goes good. Once I change my, my tsconfig.json, by the way, it looks at everything and recompiles it if required. So again, this is the thing. If I get any code hinting here, then I'm good to go. And I'm not. 
The other thing to do is that whole import export uh, situation, the way we did import export is also something we're probably going to have to change in order for us to get good code hinting. Here we're getting code hinting, but when I do module that exports, it just says any. It doesn't really give us any information, right? So going back to this, target ES module interrupt allows us to, to work with common JS. Uh, we don't care about strict because we're always using strict. We did all this regular stuff here and we're creating an express. We're using import express. Oh, look, now they're starting to use that pattern, import express from express, right? And but how do we export? How do we do a module that export? Because I'm telling you that is where the issue is, right? The module that export is the thing that we want to be able to do. So that is uh, something we need to do. So module dot exports with TypeScript. Okay, so this is something that we want to do where it says uh, TypeScript. So here's modules and um, it talks about how to use export, right? When we do an interface, but this is for export statements, right? With, um, with JavaScript, right? It doesn't do uh, TypeScript with uh, exporting um, on Node.js, all right? Because this is only for, for JavaScript. So this is not exactly all right? Let's go back to this. So not good, you know, as an example. But one thing we, we tried to do, we can, if we said, uh, like we did before, import mongoose from, if we tried this, so input mong, import mongoose from mongoose, right? And if we actually typed in from properly, there we go. Here's something, does it give me code hinting? Well, yeah, I still get code hinting here when I do this. So import mod, mo, uh, mongoose from mongoose, that works better or the same as TypeScript. And if I save it, or sorry, uh, regular JavaScript, and if I save it and go back to contact.js, it does something different. It says, hmm, const mongoose import default is like a require. That's what it does in the back end. Okay. I'm showing you the guts of it so you understand what's happening. It's good to understand the basics and then go back and try and figure out what's happening. All right, cool. So that's what this does. So import mongoose from mongoose is good. We still get the same code hinting that we got everything else. And this is a good thing, but, oh man, this isn't looking good, right? So we need some kind of export statement, which is something that we need to do. So again, we have default exports, right? So exports.default, but we don't have a uh, an export statement that is here, right? So again, let's look at that again one more time. So I'll say module exports with TypeScript, and it says, migrating from JavaScript and it says uh, module.d.ts and how do we do this? This is stack.overflow and stack overflow gives us a export is equal to person for our person class. Well, that's awesome, but that doesn't really handle how we want to do things with Node, does it? What? Can I just do export when I want to do this? Is that enough with TypeScript? Let's th let's see of uh, how this works. If I just say export, that would be terrible if that's all it was, right? So if I said something like export and I use model, what if I just did this? Is that enough? It says declaration or statement expected. Hmm. Maybe what it's looking for is export const model, right? which is something that's going to add this to the exports list. If I save this now, what does this do on the back end? If I go back to contact.js, exports.model is equal to this. Hey, it did what I what I wanted to do. Okay, cool. And I get model. Do I get this code hinting inside of my index.ts? Let's go back and see what happens. If I go contact now, contact is still any, contact model is any, but what if I do an import instead? Right, so import contact model is equal to, it says the require, and wonderful. I'm getting code hinting now, guys. Whereas before I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing before, right? And that's what I'm looking for, right? Export, it's such a simple thing, and I'm getting code hinting. Why is this awesome? Because now when I was struggling with trying to do this down here, look at this, contact is actually a model. Find, I get code hinting for finding, which is what I want to do, right? 
And I can even go into what these things are. So let's, what if I wiped out these things altogether? Do I need them anymore? Is what I'm saying. Well, no, because find is a callback. And the callback is giving me an error, right? And you can see that I'm getting a document. That's what this is. Document of type any. We don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be a document type. And error is of type any. It automatically knows that this to do. So I can have to, I don't have to put in my own version of what this is. This is wonderful. This is exactly what I'm looking for, right? So if that's the case, well, then can't I just do the same thing with my router, right? Module.exports.router. Well, yeah, right? Instead of doing this up here, router, and I'm adding to it, I can just go export router, right? And if I did that and I took away this line here, does it break? That's the thing we want to find out. So if I did this and save, what does the router do? So it says, hey, I want it exports router and look what it does for me. It just says export router dot get this, exports router dot get that. It does all this for me. It adds all this to the exports um, um, module, right? And it allows me to add everything in. It ties everything nicely together. It's a beautiful thing. Right, so I can just use instead of using an exports at the bottom, don't have to do that anymore. Right, it's not required. Same thing for config. I can save myself some trouble here. Here's my config, and instead of exports, and I can just do export, and I can do this as a const because my path isn't going to change. Right, and same thing with my session secret. I can do export, and I can tag anything I want to export here as well. Right. So I don't have to do this anymore. So let's comment this out. So, um, because we're using TypeScript. And it looks nicer, right? I'm just taking these two things and exporting what I want, right? Heck, I could even make a class and export the whole thing, just like normal. Well, this is wonderful. Why? Because when I go back to my app.ts now, and instead of me doing a let db config, I can just do an import. Import db config, and now, I can kind of look and see what it gives me. Okay, so hmm, dbconfig is a require. And then what does dbconfig have? It's a uh, this, right? But I can't just do a path because if you notice path, there's no path. What I did was I wiped it out and I create something else. db.ts has a mongodb path. Let's just call this path just to make it some something easy as well as secret, right? Just that kind of how we did it here, right? So nice, nice, nice. And when I go back to app.ts now, right? Well, it computes. It actually has it. Like it connects. It finds it for me. It gives me code hinting even on my own stuff. Guys, this is great. This is what I want, right? Why? Because then I can get code hinting everywhere else, right? And that's what I want to do uh, with you guys going forward. I don't want to do it any other way. All right, great. So what about this? Can I do module exports app? Do I have to use it like this? Or can I just do get rid of that? And I want to go into app. I'm really getting carried away now. I'm going to go into export app, right? Because that's what I want to export. And if I do that here, then in my server.ts, when I import the app, right, I should get code hinting again. Oh, man. What happened? How come I can't do this somehow, right? What? I got the app and I should be doing it, but I don't understand why, right? There's still more work for us to be done, guys, for us to go for, uh, for further than what we've done, right? When it comes to importing and exporting. And remember that what app is, right? And what we're doing with app. Right, so be careful about this. What we want to do is make an app class eventually, and then we can use some kind of setter uh, to do the port um, as an example. Also, uh, notice that everything else that we're using with app, um, that's the only error we're getting, just this. It just says property set does not exist in type of import user me app, right? That's what it doesn't understand what that is, right? Because if I go back to my app.ts, Right, then we're saying that app is actually a an express object, right? And I can do app.set in here because we know that it's express. So that's what this is. 
but we're also saying that it's a const, right? So we're exporting it, but we're also declaring it all at the same time, and that might be causing some of the issues. So let's go back to what we did before for this one only, right? So we'll go back down here. We need to import that module.exports again. So module.exports, right, uh, is equal to app, right, whatever that is. And by the way, we just can undo and get that back. So exactly what that was, as opposed to um, me trying to fiddle around with this. If I go back to my server.ts now, um, I'm still okay, but I can't use import. I'm just going to use const, and that'll fix me. We'll come back and fix this problem later on, but this is the first step into making our app completely TypeScript, TypeScript driven. All right, let's see if it's still working. So if I press save, and if I go back up to our code, so localhost, and if I look at something else like about us, right, does that still work? Is it broken? Like, how is this working? And that's the, the key, right? So if I go back, and it says app crashed, well, this is where we have to fix it, right? So it's basically saying this, just to, just to point, point this out, and then we'll stop for the day. I know we're running a little bit over time, but I wanted to go into to this detail with you, right? It says, when we're starting the app, it says router.use requires a middleware function. We've got an object, okay? And it's the way that I'm doing my exports. So it's nice that I wanted to do what I wanted to do, with my uh, my router, right? It's really nice. So if I go to router module.exports is what I really want to do here, as opposed to exports. I'm, I'm pointing this out because there's still issues. There's still issues, okay? So again, if I go back up to where it says export, I need to remove this. So it's nice. It gives me great code hinting, but it may not be what I want for everything. Again, we need to use it's like using a superpower. You don't want to use uh, in, use it indiscriminately. We want to make sure we understand how it connects to everything. Okay, so just letting you know that that is something we need to work on. When it comes to connecting pieces of Express together, we need to work on it. But when we want to do pieces of Node, no problem. Okay, so that's what we know. All right, so that is um, that is the first step. We can see that this is working now. We're connected. And now we should be able to go into each of these things and do what we want to do. Heck, we can probably even admin, login, just like we've done before. But it's going to actually just print out the page that I want, right? My contact list is actually showing me my contact list page, but it's not switching me to my contact list here. I want to switch to go there, and this is what it's going to show me when I do that, okay? Which is going to be my data right now. Eventually, it's going to res render a brand new page for me that is going to be exactly what I'm looking for here. All right, questions around what we've done. And um, if, you have, if you're not clear on any of the explanations uh, that I've given you, it's OK. Um, again, I'm just going to erase this part. Um, I just wanted to make sure you guys are all on the same page as me. I'm just going to kind of put this up there and say, made some TypeScript optimizations, which I did some. So I'll say something like, um, git add dot, git commit minus m, and I'll say um, made some TypeScript um, optimizations, git push. And I did some, right? But we still got a ways to go with Express. Any questions before we go for the day? So for your in-class exercise then, this is the first step, converting, connecting to your database. Make your database, install MongoDB, please connect. And I want you for next day, uh, please make sure uh, that you, um, please make sure that you connect to, um, uh, to MongoDB Atlas so that we work together and we're on the same page. Nick, are you good online? Did you fix it? You should be pretty good because um, Nick is watching through YouTube. Um, any questions before we go? Okay, guys, that's it for me today. Thank you so much, and we'll see you tomorrow, same time. All right, take care. I'm going to stop uh, broadcasting now. Thanks so much, everyone.
All right, and online, I'm not sure if Nick, you're still there, but if you are, cool. If not, I'll see you tomorrow too. I'm gonna to stop recording. Thank you. All right.